It's, um, the very fact that you're actually sitting to today and having this, this, this panel is very exciting to me because the very premise of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, it's a decentralized systems with no central authority that's self-governing and does not need any regulation and because it would regulate on its own. And lo and behold, you're here looking at uh, what's happening in the world and looking at Jesse's notes. It was interesting that he had crossed out and the price of Bitcoin a bunch of times, apparently checked that <laughs> couple. So the volatility and all is quite interesting. But in essence, um, I think it's a very exciting time to, to, to be interested in finance and entrepreneurship and technology because now you're beginning to see the convergence on a number of factors and realms and, and industries coming together and allowing us to do things that we couldn't do before. This whole notion of a digital currency is nothing new. We have projects, companies, startups, papers going back all the way to the 80s that were discussing these very issues. And I, some of my uh, good colleagues and friends on, on, in the venture capital world have been investing in digital currencies in the 80s and the 90s. But they all had a fundamental challenge, and that is they all required a central place, a central authority to issue, monitor, manage, this new currency. And if you are in financial services, trust is, uh, is, a, is a probably the most important thing you could possibly uh, think of or want to do. Because if I issue a currency and I, wanna, and I want to see widespread adoption, the question is, well, who am I to issue it? How can I trust you? So lo and behold, back in 2008, almost 10, ten years ago, we had this very nine-page paper, really nothing, you know, extraordinary in terms of the length of the paper, but deeply extraordinary in terms of the technical and, uh, te and, and, and engineering achievement of by Satoshi Nakamoto, whether it's a he, she, or a group of people we don't know. So I'll be referring to Satoshi um, by he or she, so interchangeably. Um, so and that was you know, the, the, probably one of the most interesting developments in the field of uh, financial technology and, and, and digital currencies because of the first time ever, um, Satoshi was able to bring together a series of developments of advancements and uh, inventions from a variety of different realms and be able to add truly remarkable and unique elements of his own to uh, create a system, i.e. blockchain, that in essence is a way for you to keep track of uh, ownership of digital assets in an immutable, unchangeable way that's fully transparent and does not require any central authority to manage it. The system up gets updated and uh, managed by the community as a whole. So in essence, that's what blockchain is and leverages a variety of, as I mentioned, a variety of different tools and techniques uh, from you know, public, private key encryption to uh, uh, mining and, and hashing and so on and so forth to enable this model to work. Now, my humble theory is that once Satoshi developed this methodology, this blockchain, he figured, well, I need to come up with a good use case for it, and he thought about, well, let's develop a currency. You know, someone that shall go unnamed is famous for saying that if you want to become rich, you should develop your own religion because you get tax-free treatment from the federal government. Uh, I think can add developing your own cryptocurrency, digital currency to, to that list as well. So, um, so that's how Bitcoin came about. And, and obviously, I hope that you know, everyone in this room understands that Bitcoin and blockchain are not the same thing. Unfortunately, you know, the, the media sometimes gets it wrong, or average person might think they are the same, and they can use them interchangeably. That's not the case. So blockchain has a variety of different applications. And, and you know, there are lots of different definitions for it, depending whether you're a purist or not. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to use the, the most um, you know, easily understood terminology to describe it. And hopefully here everyone have, have had uh, some kind of exposure to, to, to what it is in the past. But the notion of its use in the realm of finance is just one small aspect of it. With blockchain, we could do a variety of things. Uh, and uh, things that we couldn't do before. Um, for example, um, I'll mean, give you an example that's actually quite, quite interesting in the field of energy. So uh, in the past, imagine me living in a suburban house out in Texas, and I'm um, just a family of two, and we decided to put solar panels on, our, on the roof of our house. 
So uh, Texas is kind of nice and sunny, and uh, you know, certain days of the of, of the of the year, we are producing more energy that I'm uh, actually getting off the grid. So I'm actually using, you know, giving back to the grid. So I get paid for it. The other days, if I'm using more than I produce, I'm using electricity on the grid, so I have to pay the the, the utility. But the notion is that whenever I sell back to the utility, I'm selling at a wholesale price, which is fairly low. Now imagine my neighbor, uh, family of um, you know four, but in a much larger house, same you know setup, uh, does the same. Uh, but we realize that just within the two of us, uh, we could trade um, electricity produced by solar panels uh, before we even sell it to the utility, and we can come up with a better price. I can sell it uh, uh, at a higher price than wholesale, and. Uh, the person get buying it from me would be cheaper than the retail it from utility. Now you can extrapolate this across a you know, 500 or 1,000 community of, 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 of subdivision, and you realize that, oh wow, for, for the first time ever, I can trade uh, electricity usage produced by, let's say, solar panels across the community, uh, and it's all done through algorithms, so no human input involved, and you can easily keep track of everything and who gets paid and who gets, who has to pay, and you can set the price down to minutes or seconds, if you will, so you know, in the middle of the afternoon, you can charge more, in the middle of the night, you probably if you have a battery, you can contribute back and charge less, and so on and so forth. So, in, so doing all of this, imagine trying to do this by hand. It's impossible. Or, you, know, you have an army of people walking around and looking at all the meters and so on. But blockchain allows us to do it incredibly cheaply and incredibly fast uh, without much human input. So just, just one tiny example of it and the many, many other use cases that we can um, nowadays not only create but monetize. And more importantly, when it comes to uh, inventions that require a group of people of coming together, creating a community, and be able to leverage the use case for something without having a network effect uh, first. Um, you know, something like Facebook, obviously now won the day when it comes to social, uh, social network. Uh, but before it, there were many others. Uh, and uh, for a variety of reasons, Facebook became the first, and the, 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 I mean the first big win, and the only win. Um, but the, all the people that are contributing to the success of Facebook, I don't think are getting much monetary value out of it. I mean, all of you are contributing data and making you know, Facebook successful, and the more of you do join, the, the more uh, useful uh, Facebook becomes. But the, um, you know, the, the, the monetary reward doesn't go to you. Whereas imagine if Facebook was built on something like a blockchain, the exact opposite would, would come true. So at any rate, that's how you know the, the impact of blockchain. It's, it's getting us all of us, you know, the, the technologists and the financier and the economists, uh, all excited. But you, know, you could never undermine human ingenuity for good and bad. Uh, it is again my humble belief that the way Nakamoto imagined um, uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, as a you know currency, and whether we have to discuss whether it is truly a currency, i.e something that would enable you to trade, or is it a store of value, something that is just meant to store value? I think Bitcoin has a bit of identity crisis. Um, you know, depending who you talk to, you get a different definition, and definitely the panel would, would, would address that point uh, later on. Um, but you, know, you look at how uh, the Bitcoin itself has gone from a truly decentralized system to morphing to a more centralized, in which certain Groups, whether they are miners and so on, are you know tend to have more power than they than they should, or the, the fact that how the fundamentals of it the way it's been built um, is being used for not so great purposes. Um, but again, that's just a very tiny part of it. Uh, professor Bellovin, who is a computer science professor and, and cybersecurity specialist at Columbia, has an interesting way of describing Bitcoin, and that is an experiment that got out of the lab too soon. Uh, if you look at the development of it, that the way it came about, I, I, you know, you could you could say, well, you know, I, I can see that point, and I agree with that. But that, that this does not detract all the hype that you see, uh, you know, obviously all the price volatility and so on. Does not detract from the actual value and the potential of blockchain uh, first and foremost, and, and Bitcoin uh, or other cryptocurrencies or digital tokens, because of the distinction between the two, which we come to hopefully later on, 
uh, should not detract from the actual potential. And yes, you know, I do believe we live in, in, in a bubble, and bubbles are almost impossible to see while you are in their midst. They're only, vi they're only uh, um, visible you know, in hindsight. Uh, so uh, I do believe we are in a bit of a hype uh, and, and a bubble. And, uh, but that, again, there's some, there will be some winners, some losers, but that doesn't detract from the actual value that, as I alluded to before. And one last, one last analogy I, before I pass it on is that if, you know, for those of you who remember the equities market or the internet bubble of the late 90s, um, you know, a lot of people knew they were living in a bubble and there were a lot of companies that came to be that had no right to be, <laughs> to, to exist. Uh, and many of them no longer are around. And some of those that are around never achieved the stock price that they achieved back in the 90s. An example, Akamai. Akamai, you know, at some point traded, at, I believe, close to $400 or so. Uh, but nowadays, it's, never, uh, it's not even close to that number. So could you say that the market was overvalued within that you know, time period? Absolutely. But there were certain gems that uh, you know, I think all of us would kill to go back in time and buy uh, some of those stocks. For example, Amazon. Would you argue that Amazon was overvalued in 99? Uh, perhaps not. So the gems will emerge from this very dynamic and very interesting field that we are um, uh, kind of seeing happening, both from a technology perspective or financial perspective. And uh, that, again, begs the question that, you know, to some extent, to what extent and how should the regulators uh, be involved? And the very fact that now you're entering realms in which technology is it's kind of touching pretty much every industry nowadays, uh, but the specialty required to understand the intricacies of a cryptocurrency uh, uh, goes beyond the traditional role of, of regulators in which they were experts in finance or commodities and so on and so forth. So how does that interplay come about, which I hope would be uh, uh, most of the topics we'll be discussing at this, um, at this panel. Thank you, Robert.